Yeah, thank you everyone for having us. My name is Christina Acosta, Leo Sanchimiokwe. I'm Pascuayaki, my pronouns are she, they. Um, and I had the, the honor of putting together this panel with colleagues of mine through COIL. Um, we all actually met at a conference in Mexico City um, where we got some tra travel funding to go and meet together and we're gonna be talking about the projects that we did together across three countries, Canada, the United States, um, and Mexico. Each of us were in partners of, of at least two people where our, uh, our students were meeting with one another. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on mine. I won't take up too much time. Um, but yes, I'm from Cal State Stanislaw and also Cal State LA. I'm a lecturer there. And I also just got into uh, UC San Diego's PhD program in Ethnic Studies. So yay. Um, so just a quick land acknowledgement. Thank you to uh, the folks who did a land acknowledgement earlier. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note about going further than the land acknowledgement and taking action, because someone mentioned that um, earlier today. Um, so while I acknowledge and uh, you know, know that I'm an uninvited guest on this uh, ancestral territory of the uh, Anishinaabek peoples, um, I also want to acknowledge that in California, at least, um, a lot of us are having conversations about reparations and what steps we can take to um, take action as a part of the land acknowledgement. So I invite us all to look into uh, either donating our time, money, or attention to learning about the land, the people of the land, and what kind of mutual aid we can get into. Um, not only uh, giving, uh, not only benefiting from the land that we're on, but also giving back in that reciprocal relationship. Um, one thing I learned about this land in particular is that um, some of the native plants are sage, cedar, sweet grass, and tobacco. So just wanted to give a shout out to the land. Um, so on that note, um, my background is in ethnic studies. So, and also because I'm Pascuayaki, um, my epistemology, my way of being and knowing is very much centered in community and that reciprocal relationship, not only with the land, but with people. And so from that and from ethnic studies, I'm always thinking about how I can have more reciprocal relationships and be mindful of areas of power and privilege. And so I'm very aware of that as someone who lives in the global north, that it's a responsibility of mine to not just benefit um, from the labor of others, but to also put labor into um, equity in, in relationships with people who live in the global south, who I also consider my community. Um, so uh, yes, in, in essence, we need one another uh, through equity. Uh, as my colleague Olga is gonna talk about, um, equity is created and we're the creators, right? We all have a responsibility and, and the ability to make a difference. Um, so a little bit of background on how I got into creating this panel um, and also being part of COIL. Um, I'm part of the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium um, that started at Cal State Fullerton where I'm an alumni. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I got this teaching fellowship which was a referral from uh, a colleague of mine who was also I think being mindful of her power and privilege. She's a tenured professor, I was a lecturer, and she suggested that I apply for this teaching fellowship and I got it. And then um, because I had that, uh, those tools, those digital humanities tools that I hadn't been exposed to before, and I learned about the disparities in digital humanities, I heard that um, you know, they were trying to, in, in, they were trying to um, introduce it more into ethnic studies, which is my field. And so um, I got a capacity building fellowship. I started teaching this to my colleagues at Cal State LA and Cal State Stanislaw. Um, and I also introduced these technologies into my COIL project with my partner, Olga, um, whose uh, students are Nahua and um, live in Quetzalan, Mexico. So um, as I mentioned, we all met at this, this conference in Mexico City, and that's where um, when I heard about this conference from the DH Consortium in California across the Cal States, I forwarded this opportunity to my colleagues, we applied and we got into the conference. So I'm really happy that Boris is here with me and also my other colleague, thanks for being here. Um, so about my coil with uh, Dr. Escobedo Lopez, um, what we did was we used perusal to uh, look at readings together. So academic articles, our students were reading them together and also were able to um, type to one another in English and Spanish 
Um, they even have a translate tool on Perusal, as many of you probably know if you've used Perusal. Um, and so they were able to share knowledge with one another across the United States in the Central Valley of California and in uh, Quetzal and Mexico. Um, and because Olga students are indigenous, they were able to talk about how um, the encroachment of colonization, uh, essentially, was impacting their way of life and their culture and their, uh, their language, their ancestral foodways. Um, and so on my side, uh, the students were bilingual, uh, aspiring Spanish teachers. So uh, pretty much all of them came from immigrant families. Uh, I was actually impressed. Almost every single one of them spoke both English and Spanish perfectly. So they were the perfect uh, partners for Olga's class because they were really excited about it. Um, and so uh, we're both passionate, My, myself and Olga are both very passionate about the land, the people, and education, and we enjoyed sharing this knowledge across our classrooms. Um, so what could be improved in the future? Um, we didn't realize the disparities that were mentioned earlier. We didn't realize that there was gonna be so many connectivity issues. So um, that could be improved in the future. Um, I'd see that as like a systemic issue. Um, but also the students wanted more interactions together because of the connect connectivity issues and also the time difference. Um, there are some things that could be uh, reconfigured there. Um, and also I would love to plan more creati creative activities if we do this in the future. Um, maybe cooking together, right? Learning more about ancestral foods, indigenous people across the Americas, creating group poetry, watching and discussing docu documentaries and using interactive maps um, as hands-on activities. Um, I only have 10 seconds left, so thank you everyone, um, and I hope you'll hear more from my colleague Olga. Thank you everyone, yeah, okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to someone else. Um, sorry, I, I don't know where the, um, <laughs> I don't know where the other uh, presenter, oh, there we go, presenter activities. I think it's this one. Oh, no, that's not it. Okay, Martin, do you know where yours is? Oh, here's, um, okay, well, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to, oh, this is open in the chat. okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, oh, there you go. Hi, everyone. My name is Professor Boris Tapia, and I'm here with my dear colleague and friend, uh, let me put this. I'm here with my friend and colleague, uh, Karina Galvan. She is right now in Guanajuato, Mexico. And she, she and I want to present our uh, project we decided to, to present today. And um, I'm from Ecuador, actually. I live and work in Mexico. I'm a full-time researcher and professor in the Autonomous University of Delco State. And um, we're presenting the today's results of an exploratory study we proposed to our universities, the University, the University of Guanajuato and the University Autónoma del Estado de Hidalgo. Uh, our op uh, aim is to know how well are we prepared to incorporate internalization process in our educational programs. So I'm going to, to let um, Karina to start with this, and next I'm going to finish with the methodology and the results for our study. Karina, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, we are here present presenting today the results of, of an exploratory um, study. We propose uh, to both University, Universidad de Guanajuato and Universidad del Estado de Hidalgo. Uh, with the main know uh, how well are prepared to incorporate in their national process in our educational programs. The little of presentation is digital competence literacy, a way to guarantee digital rights, and we propose the next index. Here's a little introduction uh, then it discuss the role of institution and the emerging of digital rights, uh, the med we use, uh, and the main results of exploratory study. Um, well, we assume the next definition of digital competence, BC, is the confident, critical, and creative use of information and communication technologies, ICT, to achieve goals uh, relate to work, learning, inclusion, and participation in society. It's a transversal K competence with able students to acquire other competence 
and also helps them protect their information and personal data. Today, the main focus is ICT literacy of the students who belong to the Division uh, of Economic Administrative Science of Universidad de Guanajuato, Mexico, uh, through our online surveys. As introduction, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the digital transformation that presents a global cultural change and affects world educational, social relationship, consumption, leisure, administrative procedure, or access to public service. Uh, we are increasing depending of technology, its environment, device of service, so people with difficulties in using it are at risk of being not only digital, but as social as good. The main question we are attempting to answer is how prepare our high education institution to adopt virtual international mobility process such as collaborative online international learning coil that will lead the internationalization of educational programs. Uh, well, the role of institution and emergency of digital rights is digi digitalization has promoted a new economy where some knowledge institutions rely mm -hmm. to education, research, and development play a strategic role in change talents of a new society. An opportunity to, to higher education institution is digital competence literacy, which guarantee adequate master to exercise the digital rights and obligation that information and communication technology demands. Digital rights are human rights in the internet age that can be assumed an station of equal and inalienable rights in sharing in the United National Universal Declaration of Human Rights. From universal uh, rights, such as freedom of expression of individual digital rights emerging, that we guarantee the rights to express oneself through the digital media. Uh, well, now, uh, Dr. Boris Tapia is going to show uh, the med result and some conclusion. For a study on the questionnaire created by González Edal, it is a paper called, it's in Spanish, La Evaluación Cero de la Competencia Nuclear Digital de los Nuevos Grados del EESS. It's the Cero Evaluation of the Digital Nuclear Competence or the New Degrees of the, this University. It's uh, on the University of Valencia. Uh, whose aim is to estimate the basic ICT competences of university students. We made several updates to, the, to this questionnaire, uh, mainly to integrate online applications that are used by uh, students of the Guanajuato University. Uh, the central, uh, the core of this, of this questionnaire is divided in four parts, which correspond to the basic dimensions that Gonzalez assumes as they are uh, the central in the management of ICT. It's called use, training, assessment, and attitudes. And in addition, uh, we try to respond to some other questions like where are they from, uh, uh, gender, age, in which educational program they are enrolled, and uh, something like that. So um, these are some of the results. Uh, as you can see uh, in here, the, most of them use the, the ICTs for uh, act academic activities, and a lot of them for soft training and communicating. Uh, this is uh, an open question, and this is, is really important, how they use to watch videos and movies and for management activities and social networks. Um, more, most of them are using the computer more than five to eight hours a day. And about uh, how frequently they use this, those apps, we try to make a classification between all of them. And there are interesting results, like email apps, like Gmail or Lock. Uh, internet browsers, and also instant and messaging apps. Also, uh, social media networks are important. And based on what they do and what they're studying, it seems it's really respectable to find the word processor and also the, the spreadsheets. Uh, if you ask them to rate the application based on how they feel it's used for the activity of the student, we know uh, spreadsheets, uh, presentations, and email apps are most of them, uh, internet browsers and word processors also. So instant messaging app and video conferences. Uh, this probably is come from the recent uh, problem we have with the, the pandemic of COVID-19. And the closed web apps like Dropbox or Google Docs are also important. Uh, if we ask them if they say 
uh, receive their IC training with uh, in-person or online media. Um, uh, we ask them to rate their participation. Uh, say, most of them say, think they're good experience, uh, or very good experience, and also, based on what they are asking and they are studying, finances and Excel uh, spreadsheet is most of the, the apps they use. Uh, they agree. Uh, this is important to take advantage of the new virtual environment uh, or learning environments. And they think they are responsible for updating their knowledge about ICT. And it's important to acquire autonomy. About the skills uh, in their activities, they use ICT to locate, search, select, evaluate, process, and reference information. They use online collaborative work and learning environments and download open files as the most important things. Uh, about the management distribution, they think uh, it's critical responsible to evaluate the information they obtain, and may, may most of them are uh, on the positive process. Uh, about the interactions, uh, they are aware how important it is to maintain and respect uh, during the online interactions with their, their uh, partners. They understand the use in online environments, and they use ICT to study. Uh, when they use uh, ICT for active activities, they find it interesting to use them and want to learn more about them. Uh, they think the ICT significantly improves learning and enhances the autonomous learning, and so on. And I want to stop on this. Uh, from their point of view, they think the ICT is important in the first place. Uh, of course, for information, for development, fundamental activities, it is necessary and is called for training. Uh, when we ask about the how to perceive gender, uh, we have a lot of people who consider themselves a female and male, and um, a, a small percentage of people who think they are not in the, the non-binary uh, area, and most of them are between the 19 and 20 years old. Uh, this is the background uh, of what, uh, what is the career they are studying currently, and if they have an uh, internet connection and they have a computer at home, and that's at school also. This is uh, where they're from. Uh, we think it's important to to go deeper on this on this area because um, mainly the, this is where the, the university is, and they are serving to a lot of people who's near to the to the capital of the state. But we have to to learn a little bit more about what they're doing. How am I, my time? Am I on time? Oh, so about the, the conclusions, um, we found out that all the updates we made uh, are relevant for our purposes. Uh, all surveyed understood the questionnaire and answered the questions without any problem. Uh, also, additional information like um, where they're from and where they, uh, if they have uh, the same opportunities is, is important. It is important to characterize the students' states and municipalities uh, with variables with economic and social indexes, population access to ICT, or the average profession in English. So we can have uh, a little more information about this. Uh, about the use, um, we need to put attention on what are the most, most used apps and design new learning processes based on what they, on <coughs> them. For example, uh, how can you use social media for the educational purposes? Um, also, it's relevant the students use ICT for such training. Uh, we didn't ask about this, but uh, today is, is even more important than when we are doing this, this first study. Uh, the IA applied, applied to education, but we didn't uh, cover this on the this, this student. The training uh, about, uh, about the training is relevant. The students don't participate in group activities, such as online forums. Uh, even it's frequent on, on Mexican universities as, as LMSs. Uh, we need to do more research about this. And maybe it's because the environment where interactions take place are not attractive to the users. Um, about the attitudes, uh, an important group of students think it's difficult to use uh, access to ICT. Uh, this is important uh, and uh, puts a lot of, of the weight of the education process in the universities, because processes like COIL are based on the use of ICT, and students need to feel confident of their digital competences before they start learning under virtual intermediate environments. Also, the fact that the students believe that the school doesn't provide enough opportunities to learn how to use ICT, and there are enough, enough, enough resources and they are insufficient in number and quality, puts a big responsibility on Mexican universities uh, that to expand themselves into international learning. And Karina, do you want to, to finish this presentation? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, to finish, uh, we need to we, we want to, to say that uh, guaranteed digital competence is one of the uh, the biggest uh, challenge for higher education institution. Uh, the higher level of digital competence produces the less violation of digital rights. Uh, while the process of inner internationalization online collaboration will be more successful. Um, 
it is uh, identify an opportunity uh, for the centennial generation. Uh, many of them uh, are today in high institution uh, classroom and learn technologies and develop uh, digital skills in a several ways. So we, as a professor, have an important role with, with the students with all, all these to contribute to a uh, less, uh, less violation in digital rights. So, thank you all uh, so for your thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Karim. That's great. Okay, up next, um, we'll be hearing from my colleague Osama. And I just need to. Right here. Can we share the screen just so that. Oh, sure. Um, sure. Gets, yeah, absolutely. We want to make sure. Thank you. Um, will you be sharing my presentation or should I share mine? So. Oh, um, you can share yours if um, that's, that will probably be easier for you. So please go ahead. Yeah, I can do that. That's not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys see my presentation, please? Can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Yes, Osama. Yeah, thank you very much, Jenna. Well, my name is Osama, but I am a faculty at the Wilfred University. I must say thank you to the entire team for getting together. It's all Christina's efforts to bring us all together. In fact, my first exposure came on the digital humanities uh, uh, after having a discussion with Christina. So I thought, you know, I can bring my two cents from the business point of views and to bring the digital discussion on the digital barriers. Uh, the problem is while access to the digital technologies is uh, becoming global and is becoming the backbone of uh, any present day business or social infrastructure. In effective use of these technologies is still not prevalent in many countries, uh, especially in developing countries. What we need to do, we need to focus on how to provide access to digital technologies that can be of good use to many countries or societies in improving their either personal or uh, professional life. So what I've done on this, um, so now I talk about a little bit the uh, key barriers to access the digital technologies, uh, especially in uh, developing countries. The first is primarily the poverty, uh, expensive uh, devices and high telecommunication fees. Uh, the reason is the low income is one of the biggest hindrance to access the digital technologies in developing countries. Lack of disposable income makes it difficult for people to access devices that provide access to the digital technologies. Then another reason is the poor infrastructure, digital illiteracy, and lack of digital trust. Mostly developing countries have extensive rural setup, which lack, uh... I'm not sure guys, can you still hear me? If I'm receiving the messages correctly. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay, no, hear you. no problem. You know? Sorry, I repeat, the, uh, the poor infrastructure, digital illiteracy, and lack of the digital trust, you know, mostly the developing countries have extensive rural setup, which lacks infrastructure needed for tech adoption, which may include cell phone towers, routers, reliable electricity, etc. Then we have um, uh, policy, taxes, and operational barriers. Many developing countries have higher taxes on digital telecom, making all technology dependent on that expensive to use. Also, in some countries, there is a monopoly of service providers, again, making it difficult for lower learners, lower earners to access digital technology. Similarly, having limited content in local language, as well as restrictions from civil and governmental authorities, create a barrier to access to digital technology. Then I thought to talk about the digital inequality and it's not limited to rural and remote areas or to developing poor economies. It exists also in some of the largest growing and emerging economies where adequate infrastructures are not available. Attending to the digital divide and inequality is not only a social, economic, and political necessity. It is a moral responsibility in present times. It is incumbent upon us as individuals, societies, governments, and the world organizations to take part in the quest 
to close the divide for good. And here are some of the approaches in providing good use of the digital technology in developing countries in overcoming the barriers. The first is infrastructure development. It's to ensure the availability of reliable and affordable internet and other communication technologies. Then the affordable access for which develop and implement policies and procedures to reduce the cost and access of internet. Then we have the digital literacy and skills training in which we need to train individuals to effectively use digital technology. Then the last is the local content creation develop the digital content that is relevant to the local needs because many of the times that the uh, content provided by uh, content provided by the global organizations it cannot be localized to meet the local needs and then finally uh, we need to bridge the gap uh, according to the researchers if digital divide between developed and developing countries is to be diminished cost of accessing the digital technologies is to be reduced significantly, which may include low-cost telecom services, low-cost computers as well. Then access to the digital technology contributes the economy by lowering transaction costs, giving accessibility to global markets, education resources, and job access platforms. Then given the right infrastructure, developing countries can use digital technologies to accelerate the delivery of broad-based, high-quality healthcare, education, and government services. The more countries develop and set up the grounds of their digital economies, the more they can move into areas where they can become a supplier of digitally enabled products and services in the contested global digital ecosystem. Thank you very much, guys, for your patience. Uh, these were my two cents. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Osama. Okay, so our next presenter um, asked that I play her um, pre-recorded seven-minute talk. So I'm going to go ahead and play that now. There we go. Okay. Can you see this? Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today and share with you. Just. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to. Do the share screen oh, thing. Got it. No problem. All okay, right. Thank I'll you. Be so here much. today and share with you this collaborative online international learning methodology as a way for digital inclusion and equity. This is the agenda. I will tell you some important social cultural aspects of my workplace. They process of the COIL project, as well as the biggest challenges my students faced, and of course the benefits they got from this experience. I will end with some conclusions. I work on one of the campuses of the biggest university of the Puebla state, called Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla, in the small town of Quetzalan, in the northeast of the state, where 60% of the population speaks Nahuatl, the indigenous local language. I lecture English as a foreign language in the degree Territory Management and Biocultural Identity which recognizes the importance of indigenous heritage and where students analyze the impact of globalization in their everyday life and how to face those challenges from their own cultural perspective. Two of my biggest concerns as an English teacher are on the one hand, to bring my students opportunities, not only to learn the English language, but also different perspective of common issues of this globalized world. And on the other hand, to design activities that promote equity and reduce the gap of digital 
accessed. And a good example of this was the collaborative online international learning project I carry out with my colleague Christina Costa and her students from the California State University. A COIL is a model that fosters intercultural in competences through the development of learning environments that link universities, classes in different countries. We redesign a course content where 22 students were enrolled. We call our project Indigenous Conversation in North America. It was an 11 week project where students of both countries were interacted mainly asynchronously through technology devices. The main tools used in this collaboration were Zoom, Canvas, WhatsApp, and the free platform perusal, which allowed them to discuss a majority of issues, social issues that Chicano and Latino families, as well indigenous people, face in the 21st century, such as discrimination, decolonization, violence, among others. English and Spanish were the languages used in this experience. There were three main challenges my students had to face during this learning experience. One of the biggest at the beginning of this collaboration was the language barrier, because most of my students have a basic level of English. However, they overcame it by using translators and also using their first or second language, Spanish. The second challenge was the connectivity. We live in a region when it's not common for students to have internet at home. However, most of them did their assignments at contribution at the university. The third challenge was the time zone differences and the two university schedules. We have lectures in the mornings and California students in the afternoons, but the students from both countries found a way to communicate and keep in touch. Despite these struggles, my students got more benefits from this experience. They learned to use <clears throat> new platforms such as Perusal, which allowed them to make readings collectively and share different point of view in two languages, English and Spanish. My students gain self-confidence and realize they can discuss and share their point of view with people from a different part of the globe regarding common issues. They could value their own culture and language, reaffirming their identity. It was impressive to see how one of my students wrote a song for the final team project in three languages, English, Spanish, and Nahuatl, his mother tongue. The students from both countries recognized more similarities and differences among them. The students from both countries showed empathy all the time. It was a meaningful experience for everyone. There were two key factors that made this collaboration successful, adaptability and flexibility. This collaboration showed that no matter how big the digital gap you are facing, if there is willingness from both the faculty members and the students to make it possible, equity is something we need to create if we really want to reduce inequalities in our communities and among the countries. Without doubt, the COIL methodology is a powerful and useful way to foster digital inclusion and equity. Thank you. Gracias. That's automatic. Thank you, Olga.
Um, so next, we'll be hearing from uh, my colleague, Maria. And she also asked that I play her, um, her video. Oh, okay, perfect. You can just hit um, the... Oh, whoops. Uh-oh, where'd it go? Let me just move this really quick. And... Um, here, I think I know where it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. It's... It is. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And we'll Hello, my screen. name is Marisa Lerroja. Okay, thank you. I will give a short presentation on the benefits and limitations of virtual collaboration to colleagues. The aim of this presentation is to evaluate the results of three virtual collaborations between my university, Universidad Autónoma del Estado de Hidalgo, and the following institutions. The first collaboration was a course with Palo Alto College. The second one was a course with Nagoya University of the Arts in Japan. And the third course was with Universidad Autónoma de Chiapas and Northern Essex Community College. The collaboration was designed using the call methodology developed by SUNY. If you want to know more about it, you can go to their website. A call course is a virtual collaboration where two universities from different countries share activities for four to five weeks. Students from both institutions get to know each other and develop a joint project. I am going to describe some of the benefits that I have seen in the three courses that I have run. The first benefit is that the virtual interactions help break down some prejudices. Some Mexican students felt a little intimidated because they thought their peers in the other country had better skills or resources because they came from rich countries. After the interactions, it was clear that even if they have disadvantages in terms of language or academic infrastructure, they also have other skills and resources. So intersectionality is a key word in this sense. The second benefit was the collaboration between the teachers. The planning of the call course was a long process in which teachers had the opportunity to develop a personal relationship. Once this personal relationship was established, new ideas for further academic collaboration came easily. For example, Sabra Booth, my colleague at Palo Alto College, who is an artist, offered a virtual demonstration of the Mokuhanga technique to my visual arts students. A second example was a talk my colleague Miki Yokoigawa gave to the Japanese students. Miki works with me in Hidalgo, and I suggested the collaboration between these two partners who didn't know each other before the call course. A third benefit was that the virtual interaction was a way of motivating students to interact more closely with their communities. In this course, the intercultural teams were asked to develop projects to make an impact in their communities in relation to a specific problem. As they had to explain the local situation to their peers in the other country, they felt motivated to go out to the streets, talk to the neighbors, or give talks in primary schools because they wanted to gather enough information to show to their peers. Finally, the call course is a safe space to interact with students from other countries. Virtual interactions on the internet are available to all, but they do not exclude some risks. The call course provides a safe space where students can be sure that they will not be harassed or cheated because the teachers will make sure of that. Now I will describe some of the challenges that call courses present. The first challenge is the language barrier. Certainly, native English speakers have an advantage over speakers of English as a second language. However, this imbalance can also occur between two Mexican students or between a Japanese student and a Mexican student. Some of the students have a better command of English, so this situation should be addressed even in teams where all participants speak English as a second language. We mitigated this problem by encouraging collaboration rather than competition, and by asking students with a better command of English to help their less proficient peers. 
Another solution was to encourage the use of Spanish in teams where the American participants had some no low knowledge of that language. A second challenge is that virtual interactions can be more superficial than face-to-face -face interactions. It depends on the situation, of course, but virtual collaboration can be more meaningful when teachers plan a second foil course with the same participants so that they have a better chance of getting to know each other. Finally, I found that interacting virtually can present too many challenges at once. Digital literacy, lack of internet access or unforeseen situations like a hacker attack or a snowstorm can affect the completion of the projects. If we add language barriers or time zone differences, the challenges can be too overwhelming and some of the participants may decide to drop out. This actually happened with our partners in Massachusetts. In conclusion, I will say that COIL can inspire students with no previous international experience to improve their proficiency in a second language, to plan a future in-person international exchange, to become aware of the global dimension of their professions, to recognize regional differences within the same country, to know ways of approaching a problem in different fields, and to challenge ways of thinking and relating. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to hear your questions. Thank you, Thank you Maria. Um, okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. Hello, my name is Maria Isabel Rojas. Oh. I will give a short presentation on the benefits and limitations of virtual collaboration to COIL. The aim of this presentation is to evaluate the results of three virtual collaborations between my university, Universidad Autónoma de Brasil. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> I was like, oh, it started playing again. Okay, so our last presenter is Victoria. Um, Victoria, did you want me to share your um, your presentation, or did you want to share your screen? I I will not uh, share the screen. I just want to talk because I think we have very little time. Thank you very much. Thank you Christina. so much. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the Michigan State University for this opportunity to share with all the distinguished public who is giving us the opportunity to share this incredible, a very fructiferous uh, experience that we had by uh, implementing in our university courses the methodology of COIL. Well, um, I present myself, I'm Victoria Alba Lugo from the La Salle Mexica University. I work together with my partner, Dr. Michael Saint, who unfortunately is not here with me, and he is professor and a director of the Fair Housing Legal Support Center at the University of Illinois in Chicago. We have implemented this course between the UIC and La Salle, Mexico to um, achieve the goal of analyzing the privacy in the US and the Mexican legal system. We have go through this experience in different courses that we began in 2021. What we like to share about our experience is that we need to encourage legal scholars in the United States and Mexico to think internationally about the right to privacy in the digital area. Globalization and new technologies threaten the protection of the basic right to be left alone. And the right to privacy of a person in both countries. The pandemic and post pandemic periods have further demonstrated that the interrelatedness of privacy concerns in both countries and the need for a uniform international legislation and legal system to protect privacy in the digital area. We have analyzed to achieve our goals, the Mexican and the United States constitutional rules. And this 
was very important for our students because Mexico and the U.S. are uh, have different backgrounds about the legal family. Mexico has a French background, and um, United States has a um, Anglo-Saxon background in the legal system. So we find out that uh, this was very important for students to understand that even if we are very near from each other in terms of a geographical approach, in the legal system field, we came back from a very different system. One is more advocated to the oral tradition and the other one is to the Brighton tradition. So we also analyzed the pandemic period why it was that so important? First, because thanks to the technologies, we have the chance to share this knowledge between students in the United States, in Chicago City, and Mexico City as well. But also because technology also is related to the exercise and the protection of a very important right, that is the privacy. And we know technology comes from all around the world. And during the pandemic period, in order to go further with all kinds of human and social needs, we needed to, to change the presential mode to the remote mode. And that was the exposure of a lot of privacy rights that we are not all the time aware of how important it is to be protected. So, and furthermore, we like to share with the students the courses reflects upon the original of the right to privacy and how is it protected through the constitutions, laws, and practices in two nations. They also look another European and international standard in order to have a global vision about how societies consider to protect in the best way to privacy, right? Students also learn not only the field of information, privacy, the gain insights into the constitutional structures and the dispute resolution systems of the two nations. They also learn about the education of lawyers and the workings of a legal professional in Mexico and the United States. Very little of our students knew that the way of how a professional in the legal field is formed in the United States is very different from the way we prepare and become a professional law in Mexico. So this was very important for them to know as well. The first coil, coil courses started in the fall of 2021, and we continue repeating this experience and adjusting to the new methodologies and the uh, interests of our students. So um, we focus mainly in elements that are related to the COIL methodology, as they could be the focus in the course in the private law in Mexico and the United States, as well as the applicable international and European standards. However, the actual purpose of the course is much broader. The format allows the students to compare how privacy rights are derived, how they are protected, and how disputes involving privacy rights are resolved under different legal systems. The students discuss how U.S. courts protect privacy through their own writing common law, which is a constantly evolving source of law. Mexican courts are constrained to apply the statutes and codes. The students learn how international law and treaties shapes the development of human rights in Mexico and the United States, and how cases are litigated. They learn how jurists 
function is the US. The format allows the students to enter chat rooms to explore ideas and experiences. The course is taught in English and in, in Mexican and in Spanish um, uh, to improve their second languages. Some of our US students speak Spanish, so they are able to improve their second languages as well. The student has have identified the primary value of courses to the interchanges with their foreign counterparts, and they learn that lawyers are educated differently in the United States and Mexico, but they also learn that they have similar concerns and experience. And we like to highlight that during the pandemic period, the COIL course was a source of relief of the stress that we all have because of um, the confinement of the pandemic period. During the classes, they could feel or have the sensation that they could go abroad, but they were still at home. So thank you very much and I'm open to any questions. Uh, thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone, that was everyone. Um, so we're open now to questions if anyone has any, and thanks again for your time. There's one in the back. So just probably to uh, kind of ask uh, the last presenter, because uh, your presentation is kind of um, closely related to what I do. I just want to find out, considering the, uh, the differences between data privacy laws uh, across countries, how do you factor in or consider the peculiarities in each of the country in the use of this platform, especially when it comes to data sharing from one country to another, since it allows to them from different countries. How do you ensure that uh, data privacy rights are not breached when making use of the platform? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. This was one of the main points that Professor Michael Senga and myself we're thinking about while we design the course. We attach the study to the human rights. So if we start by thinking that we all are humans and that we all need this privacy space for being a social member, then we could um, make a point about how could be the same human being whenever place we are around the world and that we need to have this privacy to be a human being. So when we are talking about the use of technology or platforms, we can see the representation of a human being. That is true because you are looking at me in Michigan and I'm here at Mexico City. But the truth is that there is a real person only human being that is just you and me, that we are present and we have rights to protect our privacy, however we are around the world. And even if the considerations or the constitutional frames could have different points of view or approaches, it doesn't necessarily imply that every single constitution in the world recognize a human right, a right to be protected wherever we are. Nonetheless, if we are using uh, interaction about platforms, technology or whatever, that is not a sufficient reason to lack our privacy rights. They are very, very important in this digital area. 
and we cannot give up on rights just because of the progression of technology. 